Hello, I'm Julia Griffith and thank you so much for joining me whilst we talk about one of my absolute favourite topics, which is diamond. Now today we're going to be focusing fully on this advertisement slogan, A Diamond Is Forever, which was famously concocted by the diamond company De Beers in 1947. Now this was dubbed the slogan of the century in the year 2000 and even though it's recently celebrated its 70th year anniversary, it's still considered one of the greatest advertisement campaigns of all time. So today we're going to fully focus on this concept of A Diamond Is Forever. We're going to look into the marketing campaign, its creation and also its impact that it's had on the diamond industry and also the hearts and psychology of every generation since. We're then going to look into the facts behind this statement. So we're going to answer the question, are diamonds really forever? This is going to be the more sciencey, gemological part of the presentation. And just for fun, we're also going to discuss all the ways that we can destroy diamonds. Now to start off, we're going to talk about the most significant diamond discovery of all time. And this occurred in South Africa in 1867. And this was so important because it led to a surge of diamonds on the market. Before the discoveries in South Africa, diamonds were exceptionally rare, only coming from a few locations worldwide. So they've come from India, and these have been documented since 800 BC. Uh, there's a few small deposits in Borneo, Indonesia, and also uh, there was finds in Brazil, which were in 1725, so two and a half thousand years after India. Now, these are the only locations diamonds came from. They were only found in secondary riverbed deposits. So the amount of diamonds per year was very small, only a kilogram or two per year. South Africa was different. The deposits in South Africa were primary deposits. And by that, we mean that they had a volcanic origin. Miners were literally digging into old volcanic kimberlite pipes, and these were studded with diamonds. This led to an increase in range of colour, sizes and qualities of diamonds. For example, we had industrial diamonds that we'd never had before. And also soaring diamonds had just been developed so we could cut a diamond crystal in half and make two cut diamonds from one stone. Also, there was huge developments in diamond cutting because now that diamonds weren't as rare, we could sacrifice some of the crystal yield to create a more beautiful cut stone. Now the De Beers company was founded in these diamond fields in the Kimberley regions of South Africa by Cecil Rhodes and he founded the De Beers Consolidated Mines Limited in 1888. Now this was a monopoly and a monopoly is defined as a group of associated companies that all have one common agenda. And in the case of the De Beers group, the agenda was to find diamonds and to sell diamonds. Now they were extremely successful. Uh, by the 1900s, they owned 30% of the mining operations worldwide and also had control of 90% of the rough diamond supply. And this is because they made arrangement with smaller companies where they would buy all of their annual production for a set rate. Now the reason they did that was so that they could maintain a balance between the supply of diamonds on the market and the demand so that they could also guarantee the prices of diamonds. Now, despite their best efforts, by the 1930s, the diamond sales were at an all-time low. The sales themselves had halved in number and also the prices were on a steep decline. And this wasn't due to an oversupply of diamonds. The reasons were mainly economical. For example, most of the world, particularly Europe, were still getting over the First World War. Also, there was the stock market crash of 1929, and this kick-started the Great Depression throughout the 30s. And not to mention, we were also then on the brink of another world war, so World War II. So at the time, attitudes towards diamonds really were that they were an unnecessary 
product. Engagement rings were a thing, but most brides-to-be would prefer to have a car or a washing machine or something useful than a piece of jewellery. So in 1938, De Beers sought to help this situation by hiring an advertisement company, and this was N.W. Air and Sons. Now, the aim was very simple. The aim was to increase the sales of diamonds. And they targeted the USA for this marketing campaign because there was a lot of tension in Europe due to the upcoming war. And also, the USA did have a market for diamonds. About 10% of ladies that were getting engaged were doing so with a diamond engagement ring. So the way that they were going to do this was to reinforce this connection between diamonds and love. Now, NWA intended to do this with quite an aggressive marketing campaign that would cover print, radio, and eventually television as well. And this would all be put into the public in America. But they did have one problem, and that was the antitrust laws of America, particularly the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was put into place in 1890. And this act was passed specifically to protect national companies and also consumers from international monopolies. So as a result, De Beers were not allowed to clearly market their brand or to even show pictures of their products or pictures of jewellery, which makes things quite difficult. However, they had an ingenious idea to use fine art by famous artists within their advertisements. And this was a big hit. Once they started doing it, everyone was doing it within marketing. And they really went for the big guns because they used some really big artists such as Picasso, Dali, Durain and Duffy. And also commissioned some original artworks as well from some other very, very famous artists. Now this one here... This is from the very early campaign, so before the tagline, A Diamond is Forever, was even thought up. Uh, this is a picture by Salvador Dali. And then to the side, you can see some very floral, romantic text. That's very, very typical of all the De Beers campaigns in the early years. And then also there'd be some drawings of diamonds with their relevant prices for that time. So this is a really typical appearance of one of the adverts from De Beers in the early years. And this early campaign was extremely successful. So in the first few years, diamond sales went up by 55% in the USA and diamond prices followed. So they had also increased. And by 1947, the sales of diamonds had tripled. And that is because uh, as post-war, there was a spike in engagements and therefore a spike in engagement rings. So to give you some price comparisons, in 1939, at the very beginning of the marketing campaign, diamonds were selling between $900 and $1,750 for a two carat diamond. And then by 1947, the same range of diamonds would sell for $1,500 to $3,300. So you can see the prices have almost doubled in that time. Now, uh, I've got to say that these prices do look very appetizing now, don't they? Oh, we'd all have one. But this is uh, the dollars for that time. So it still would have been a lot of money. Now, it was in 1947 that this campaign became legendary. And that's because the famous tagline, a diamond is forever, was put together and used in pretty much every De Beers advert and campaign ever since. Now, this was thought up by Mary Frances Geraghty and uh, she was asked to do so by the advertisement company. They were looking for a signature line because they realized that it wasn't very clear that they were advertising diamonds. So they wanted a sign-off line, something short, succinct, and very clear what they were advertising. Now, at first, this tagline was criticized by other members of the team for being grammatically incorrect because a diamond is forever could be likened to saying a diamond is eternity. It doesn't quite make sense. Forever is a concept and a period of time forever. You know, it's like saying a diamond is future. A diamond is now. It doesn't quite make sense. But nowadays, it seems to make perfect sense for us. 
So um, it was extremely successful, even changing the rules of grammar. That's how good this tagline was. So here are some of the first few iconic um, advertisements by De Beers. This was from the first couple of decades from all those famous artists. You had um, sometimes drawings of diamonds within them, particularly shown in the night sky. And then the description would explain, you know, the star's beauty mirrored within the diamond. And you can see within each advert that tagline, a diamond is forever. Now, the effects of this tagline were very strong. It very effectively fused together the idea of diamonds with something permanent. So for eternity, for forever. And it did this very well. And by fusing those two concepts together of diamonds and forever, and then putting them into an article of jewellery which you use to betroth yourself to someone, so an engagement ring, gave the idea of everlasting love. Also, this advertisement slogan, it did insinuate and suggest that you don't get rid of diamonds so that you do keep your diamonds forever. And so rather than them being sold once you're done with them, no, they become heirlooms and they get passed down for generations in the family. And also, amazingly, De Beers managed to target their marketing for all budgets. Even though this was a luxury product and it was expensive, they managed to make it appeal to everyone. This idea, this ideology of everlasting love. And they did this by a little blurb within every advert that they had, which basically says that you don't have to have an expensive diamonds. There are lots of different qualities and factors that make up the price. And also, don't worry, because you can get a payment plan with your jeweler. So really allowing diamonds to be for everyone. Here are some more advertisement campaigns, so from the 70s and the 80s, or also here putting a price on the diamond as well, so a two month salary, that was De Beers' suggestion. Also in the 1980s, they marketed diamond jewelry directly for men. And then here's one from the 1990s, and this echoes the TV advert, which was very iconic, you might remember it, where there's two shadows, all in black and white, and uh, the only thing in colour is this yellow gold diamond ring. And in every advert you will see this famous tagline, a diamond is forever. And apart from these printed adverts, you also had a lot of exposure on radio. So they had their own programs explaining about prices and also who had just bought what diamond. They also had, uh, in I think about 125 newspapers in the USA, they would print something known as the Hollywood celebrities, where they would show all the celebrities in their diamond jewellery. They also commissioned to have socialites pictured with their new diamond engagement rings. And of course, there was product placement within television. So you had uh, a diamond is forever within the James Bond film, A Diamond is Forever in 1971. And also in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, you have Marilyn Monroe singing Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. Now, the immediate effects were pretty clear. I mentioned before that before the campaign, about 10% of women within the USA would opt for a diamond engagement ring. And then after the campaign, so 1951, after the slogan came in, uh, 80% of women had a diamond engagement ring. And this isn't just for the USA. This is a number of other countries as well, including the UK, China, Japan, Mexico, Canada, And even now, it is the most popular choice for an engagement ring. So long-lasting effects of the campaign. So we still have this very strong connotation between diamonds and everlasting love. It is still the number one choice for an engagement ring today. And not only is it a choice, it's almost an expectation on both parties. So it's an expectation that the man will be proposing with a diamond ring and that the woman will be accepting a diamond ring. And this has come and turned into a billion dollar industry. Uh, Ever since the 50s, it's been a billion dollar industry for wholesale as well as the retail markets. And we still have that real synonymous association that diamonds are forever. 
and that they can't be broken. So this really shows you the power of advertising, that even 70 years on, this is still affecting the psychology and actions of entire cultures and generations. So why does this tagline work so well? Is it just clever advertising or is there something else to it? Well, I like to think it's because this tagline is rooted in fact. So a dime is forever suggesting that something will last forever. Uh, this actually does reflect the physical properties of diamond. It wouldn't have worked so well for any other gemstone. For an example, fluorite is forever wouldn't have worked because after a couple of years, people would have said, well, that's not true. Get rid of that tagline. My fluorite's all abraded and cracked in half. So I think it only worked because it was for diamond. And that's because diamond is a super material and a super material is one with remarkable physical properties. And diamonds have a few remarkable physical properties. Uh, one of them is their thermal conductivity. So diamonds are the best conductors of heat out of all other materials in the world. Also, they are one of the most transparent materials. They certainly are the most transparent gem, which is why when we look into them, they're so crystal clear, also allowing the light to play around them perfectly without being interrupted. And very famously, diamonds are known for their apparent strength. And this actually is their namesake, Diamond comes from the Greek word adamas, and this is loosely translated to unbreakable, invincible, or unconquerable. And the reason that they were thought to be unbreakable is because we could not cut and polish them for the first 2,000 years that we had them on this earth. We couldn't cut and polish them like we could other gems. So jadeite, that's been cut since 3000 BC, but we couldn't cut diamonds until the 1300s. And that's because diamonds do have an unparalleled hardness. So therefore, when we first used them, they were always in their rough crystal form. And here I've got a whole lineup of different natural diamond crystals for you to see. Because of this apparent strength, they were given these powers and they were thought to protect those who wore them. And quite brilliantly, even millennia ago, they believed that the clearer the crystal and the better the clarity and quality of the stone, the better the powers of protection. So great salespeople, even way back then. And because of these ideas that they could protect you, uh, they were used commonly for amulets and talismans, as well as tools and, of course, gems. Now, this strength that we speak of is actually known as a diamond's durability, and this is made up of three different factors. So hardness, which is the ability to resist scratching, and diamonds have unparalleled hardness. They have excellent hardness. Toughness, which is the ability to resist breakage. Uh, this is the Achilles heel for diamond. This is why a diamond is forever isn't quite true. Uh, diamonds are said to have good relative toughness. And then we have stability, which is the ability to resist chemical alt alteration, such as light and heat. And it's got very good stability. Diamonds are inert to many things that we can throw at it. So let's talk about hardness first of all, because this really is the biggest reason why we think that a diamond could last forever. And that's because diamonds are the hardest natural material in the world. I would love to say that diamonds are the hardest material in the world full stop, because they very nearly are. The only things that are harder are currently not being used for any commercial reasons they're mainly uh, being developed in labs and are often very small particles of things or very small um, pieces of things, such as graphene, um, which is said to be harder than diamond, although arguably that's got a high tensile strength, not hardness technically. Also carbine I've heard is harder, but I haven't looked into that properly yet. And also lunsdalite, which is a hexagonal crystalline form of um, diamond. The way that we measure hardness for gems and minerals is on the Mohs scale of hardness. This is a relative scale which runs from 1 to 10, with 1 being talc, 
10 being diamond and other common minerals in between. Now, all of these minerals that have been chosen to be within this scale have a very consistent hardness no matter where we mine them from in the world. And we can place other gems in this scale as a comparison to these known hardnesses. Now you will notice that this is not a linear scale. So what I mean by that is the hardness of two is not twice as hard as one. Instead, it is relative and you will see an exponential increase in hardness, particularly towards the higher end of the scale. And you will also notice that there is a bigger difference between the hardnesses nine and 10, which is sapphire and diamond, than between all of the other hardnesses put together. So diamonds, even though they are just one level up from sapphire, they're actually four times harder. They are exponentially harder than ruby and sapphire, making them a great choice, particularly for rings. Now, other gemstones that we use in jewelry, they have to have a certain hardness for them to last with wear and tear. So most of them lie between six and eight and a half in regards to hardness. The only gems that are harder than this are ruby and sapphire, synthetic morsonite, which is a man-made diamond simulant. And as I mentioned, way up here is diamond. Now, this hardness means that diamond can take and retain an excellent polish. That means we can polish it to a very high standard and give it an unparalleled luster, which is known as adamantine luster within the trade. Also, you'll notice that it has precision cut facet edges. No other gem shows such sharp facet edges. And because of a diamond's hardness, this polish quality is retained forever because nothing can scratch a diamond apart from another diamond. So this is where we have to be careful, but that can be avoided. So this means they look as perfect as the day they were cut forever. And this makes them a number one choice for use in jewelry. To show you some comparisons of wear and tear of gems set in jewelry, here is a diamond that's been worn in a ring uh, every day for 18 years. And you can see on this surface, on the reflection, that there are no scratches or abrasions to the table whatsoever. And you've got still precision cut, sharp facet edges. Now this is typical for the wear and tear of diamond. If we compare this to a ruby, which has a nine hardness on the most scale of hardness, this Ruby has been worn every day as an engagement ring for six years, and you can see a lot more wear and tear than we had on the diamond. We have quite excessive abrasion all around the facet edges of the table here, a number of scratches, and also a large chip here as well. Now, this is actually my good friend's engagement ring. Uh, she does have, I think, uh, quite a busy lifestyle. She's a new mum, and also she's a hairdresser, and so I think maybe the ring goes through quite a lot. So to be fair to corundum and rubies and sapphires, I want to show you another example. So this is a sapphire. Um, it's actually my friend's mum's engagement ring and she's worn it every day for 40 years. So uh, you can see, even though it's got the same hardness as a ruby, this stone has worn much better, but we still do have abrasion to those facet edges, some scratches on the table of the stone and also some indentations as well from some impact. Let's have a look at another type of gem. So these are savorite garnets and diamonds within my mum's ring. So uh, here we can also see heavy abrasion to the garnets. Garnets have a hardness of 7.5 and we can see the wear and tear that it's had on this gem. So <clears throat> just from wearing it every day, we have this rounding of the facet edges and a very dull luster in that area as well. If we compare it to the diamonds, the diamonds look perfect. So again, that surface does not have a single scratch on it and the edges are still perfectly sharp. 
So this shows you how good diamonds are as a choice for a gemstone in a ring because these gems have gone through the same lifestyle, they've gone through the same experiences, they've been in the same ring and yet the wear and tear is vastly different. So as I said, the only thing that can scratch diamond is diamond, but I'll be honest, out of all the diamonds that I've seen, you don't see scratches all that often. Uh, if they do happen, it's going to happen before they're set, usually, and that's because a lot of diamonds are actually stored in the same packet together. Uh, things that you do see more commonly are abrasions. So for example, here is the coulée of the stone, which is the point at the back of the stone. And you can see it looks white and that's because that has suffered abrasion. Uh, very much so because a coulée is quite a vulnerable area on a diamond because it's so thin. Also, you might see abrasions to facet edges, which I don't have any here. There might be one just there, which will look just like white um, little marks on the those facet edges but again you don't see them all that often unless um, unfortunately two diamonds have rubbed together. So there are ways that we can avoid any damage and this is by being smart with our storage so uh, do store any loose or jewellery items that contain diamonds separately from each other and all other objects uh, particularly earrings make sure that you still put them in two separate packets or tie their backs together so their heads can't bash together. Uh, and also do be mindful when wearing diamonds on both hands, particularly eternity diamond rings where the diamonds come on the inside of the hand as well. Because when you might be washing your hands, uh, you might actually be scratching any rings or pieces of jewellery on the other hand with the diamonds from the eternity ring, something to be very mindful of. Let's move on now to stability. So as I said, diamonds have excellent stability. Uh, they can resist really high temperatures, particularly if you uh, balance this out with pressure or in a vacuum atmosphere, they can get to really hot temperatures. Uh, they also do not suffer from thermal shock. So we can heat them up really hot and then put them into ice cold water and they will not shatter like all other gems are likely to do. Uh, they also are not affected by a lot of radiation so for example uh, daylight doesn't affect them at all uv doesn't affect them uh, only gamma rays really can affect diamonds and even then it's only their color and that's one way that we uh, treat diamonds to turn them green and some other colors as well and also they are inert to strong acids and alkalis so there are a few exceptions to this stability rule uh, one is burning so diamonds can burn and they can ignite and burn completely away into CO2 if we heat them to around 640 to 900 degrees Celsius in a pure oxygen atmosphere. We can just burn them away to nothing. Also, diamonds do burn when heated next to iron. So this is more relevant for industrial applications. But if you do have a diamond drill bit that's drilling into a ferrous metal, so one that contains iron, uh, the carbon will rebond with the iron to create iron carbide. And also, just a fun fact, uh, scientists are now saying that diamonds are very, very, very slowly converting into graphite. And that's because graphite is the more stable form for diamonds on the Earth's surface. But diamond atoms are in such tight bonds that they can't convert quickly, but apparently are doing so at a very, very, very slow rate. But apparently this will take billions upon billions upon billions of years to actually occur. So, um... The earth will probably be ended before diamonds actually convert to graphite, but it's still a pretty cool fact. And we can uh, induce this conversion a lot quicker if we use specialized X-ray lasers. So we can destroy diamonds that way if we want to. But most of these things aren't really relevant for us in jewelry. Uh, the only one that is relevant is this burning of diamonds. Now we can burn diamonds with a jeweler's torch and also the surfaces can burn within uh, fires. However, uh, this doesn't evaporate away into CO2 like I mentioned before. Uh, really it's just a surface burn, it only goes in a few nanometers and can be easily polished out. 
But to show you what a burnt diamond looks like, I actually, um, my friends did this for me just the other day. They sacrificed a diamond for this presentation. So thank you very much, Douglas Hughes Fine Jewelry. Uh, here is a diamond before during heating and then after. So this has burnt surfaces and these are known as smoked or sugared diamonds in the trade. Now we can avoid this burning of diamonds when it's under the jeweler's torch. Ideally, diamonds will be taken out of the setting before any heat is applied to the item. That is the safest thing to do. Uh, but if that's not an option, then jewelers can cover the diamond within protective borax. And borax will stop any oxygen uh, getting onto the surface of the diamond, therefore stopping any oxidization. But if diamonds do burn, like I mentioned, we can repolish them. This will only remove a few points and this then brings the diamond back to its former glory. There are some exceptions to this burning of diamond surfaces uh, and one great visual example of this is the 911 brooch and this brooch suffered major fires in the 911 attacks in 2001. Uh, this was kept within building 5 of the World Trade Centers within a security deposit box and the whole room caught on flames and everything around this brooch was reduced to ash. However, this brooch, which clearly came into contact with high temperatures, naked flames, and also was in an oxygen atmosphere, and we know this because of the oxidized white gold, which has gone completely black due to that atmosphere, uh, but the diamonds that are in it were untouched, perfectly white, um, burnt free diamonds. So uh, even though diamonds can burn, sometimes they don't for some miracle reason. Now let's move on to the question that many of us want to know about diamonds, which is, can we break a diamond? The answer is yes. Yes, we can. Diamonds can chip and diamonds can shatter upon blunt impact. So here is a picture of a chip in a diamond. You will notice that the diamond itself is already heavily fractured internally. And this is often the case, and diamonds don't chip easily, uh, often it's an extension of pre-existing fractures that extend and intersect each other that might cause a chip to occur. But let's look into this in a bit more detail. So when we talk about chipping or breaking diamonds, we're now referring to the durability property uh, of toughness. So as a reminder, toughness is the ability of a material to resist breakage. And there are two different types of breakage. We have fracture, which is a non-directional breakage in a material. And then we have cleavage, which is a directional breakage within some crystalline materials. Now, in regards to a diamond's toughness, diamonds are relatively brittle. And the reason that they're brittle is actually due to the same reason that they're hard. And that's all to do with their atomic bonds. Now, diamonds have incredibly concentrated and incredibly strong covalent bonds. And this is what makes them so hard. This is what makes them resistant to any scratches. But this also makes them unflexible. So if a diamond does suffer a sharp impact, there is no way that a diamond structure can locally plastically deform. It can't bend, so it can't share out that shock and share out that energy. Instead, when you hit a diamond, that very edge that you hit it takes all of that force. And for that reason, diamonds can do two things. Uh, one, they might be able to resist it if you happen to hit it with, you know, not quite enough force and in one of their stronger directions. Or it will fracture or cleavage, sometimes completely shattering depending on what point you hit the diamond. Diamonds also can exhibit cleavage. So cleavage is that directional breakage that can happen in some crystalline materials. And here is a cleavage crack shown here within a diamond. And diamonds have four directions of cleavage within its structure. And these are parallel to the crystal faces. 
So even though diamonds can chip, fracture and cleave, they don't do so easily or without a reason. It's normally a really unfortunate event if your diamond does break. And there are some situations where diamonds are more likely to break. And that is, as I mentioned before, if the diamond has existing fractures or cleavages, because a knock can cause these breaks to extend, intersect, and then parts of the diamond to fall out. Also, thinner or narrow areas on a diamond are more susceptible to breakage. So these areas, namely, are the coulée, so that point of the stone, and also the girdle area. So this is the thinnest part of the stone around the edge where it gets set by. And uh, breakage is even more likely, uh, especially in a ring, if it's in an exposed mount. And by that, I mean a four claw setting. A four claw setting is a very vulnerable setting for diamonds because you have all of this girdle area which is exposed to knocks and blows. So there are ways to avoid this. Uh, one is if you're choosing a diamond for a ring to maybe design an inner ring mount that offers more protection to the diamond. So for example, a rub over bezel setting where the metal goes all the way around the diamond, therefore protecting the girdle. Or if you're in the lucky position of selecting your diamond, maybe choose one that doesn't have fractures or cleavages near the edges, or choose one that doesn't have extremely thin or very thin girdles. That advice mainly is for rings. It doesn't matter so much for other items of jewellery, such as pendants and earrings, because you're less likely to knock these diamonds anyway. So we've covered all the ways that diamonds can be damaged and the ways that we can destroy them. Uh, if you're looking for some more inspiration, there are many videos on YouTube which show you experiments that prove that diamonds are not forever. This includes things such as whacking diamonds with hammers or even crushing them in a hydraulic press. And I've actually got this video to show you here. So this is one of the hydraulic press videos. There is our diamond victim. And here it goes. Mm. As you can see, that wasn't difficult to do. The diamond is laid on its side and it breaks very quickly, unfortunately. Um, now, there's something else at play here, which you don't know yet. Uh, this video, these guys, they do show the certificate or the diamond report for the diamond at the beginning of this video. And actually this diamond has I3 or PK3 clarity. Now, if you don't know what that means, that is the lowest clarity grade that can be assigned to a diamond basically means that there are going to be some serious durability issues within that diamond. So large fractures, multiple fractures or cleavages. So its durability was already compromised. So what happens if the diamond has better clarity? And let's have a look. So there's another video here by some other hydraulic press guys that like to crush things. And now this diamond is an SI1. So only has small inclusions in it. As you can see, uh, this is now the diamond that has pushed into the steel um, from the hydraulic press. It hasn't broken at all. And this is actually a very typical response. They say if you do crank up a diamond in a vise where it can take such high pressures, it's more likely to penetrate into the steel than break. Um, also, there are a number of those videos I mentioned where people are hitting it with a hammer. If it's on its side, actually, unless the diamond has fractures in it, they couldn't break it. It was only when they turned it on its table and hit the coulée, that small point, that's the only time it shattered because that tiny surface area was taking the entire force of the blow and then that energy was going through and breaking the bonds and shattering the diamond. Now to give you a bit of history. Uh, so we spoke about how diamonds are unbreakable. We've proven that that's not the case. But this is still one of the biggest misconceptions today and it has been throughout history.
That stems from a number of documents that do say that diamonds are unbreakable. For example, this one from Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder, who says that diamonds, when tested upon an anvil, uh, resist the blow and the anvil breaks instead. So people really did believe, and still do now, that diamonds are unbreakable. But we know better. And actually, we have known that they are breakable for centuries or even millennia. In fact, experienced miners used to trick novice miners into breaking their diamonds based on this myth, this misconception. So the new miners would come and say, oh, I found diamonds. And the experienced miners would say, oh, well, to test them, smash them with a hammer, because if they break, they weren't diamonds. And so the new miners would break all their diamonds, um, feel very disappointed, maybe give up their mine claims, and then the experienced miners would collect up the remaining stones. So very cheeky. So in conclusion, are diamonds really forever? Well, the answer is yes and no because arguably we can destroy the material. So as I mentioned, we can burn them off into CO2. We can shatter them into a thousand pieces, although arguably the pieces would last forever. And then also I mentioned that very, very slow conversion to graphite. But for us wearing diamonds in jewelry, there is every single possibility that your diamond will last forever because it does have these remarkable properties which allow it to look perfect, beautiful and the same as the day it was cut forever. And from everything that I know about gems and jewellery, I truly believe that they are by far the best choice for an engagement ring. They wear better than any other material out there and they really will last a lifetime and then some. So thank you so much for joining me for this webinar. I do hope that you enjoyed yourselves and learned a thing or two and I hope to see you again.